G'day everyone, today we're going to be doing some work on the S600. More specifically, we're working on the chain drive rear end, getting it back together. Quick recap for those of you that don't know, this is a Honda S600. It's Honda's first mass produced car that they sort of sold around the world. As well as having a super high rig engine, and rack and pinion and coilovers and a bunch of other stuff that's cool for a 1960s car, one of the things they're best known for is their chain driven in the back. So like any normal car, this is the diff goes under the car, what you would normally have is a wheel on each end and the whole diff will move up and down. What Honda did <laughs> is add these chain cases on the end, so inside here is like a, a bike chain and instead of the whole axle pivoting up and down, this piece pivots up and down by itself like that and the, the axle is mounted solid to the car through these blocks, so it's a way of getting independent suspension. Being that that was Honda's first car, they were a motorbike manufacturer, so this is a very motorbike-like rear end. That's why a lot of the parts of the car, like the engine and the suspension, is all motorbike style stuff. As you can see, I've only got one chain case. What we're going to do today is put the other one together. The way I normally do these sorts of videos is I put this one together, so I have an idea of how it goes, I know how to put it together, and then I can have a nice, smooth, thought-out video explaining how this one fits together. I haven't worked on this car for a long time. I put this together, like, maybe even two years ago, at least a year ago. I have no idea how it goes together anymore, so I did that to work it out. I don't remember, so today we're going to figure out how this goes together. So I've really stitched myself up by not remembering how this goes together and doing this side so long ago from when I pulled it apart. We'll start with this side, this is the side the bearings go in. I, it was all, as you can see, it's all been sandblasted and it's super clean. It's collected a lot of dust and stuff, so I'll give this a blow off and then we'll figure out where we're going to go from there. This was the last major thing I did on this bench, because the bench had been too much of a mess to use since then. This box under here should be everything related to that. So all my new bearings and then all the shafts and middle pieces and brake backings and all that stuff should be in this box. But a lot of it is old bits and then a lot of it, there's actually a bunch of bearings I got that I had were wrong. So I have to sort out what's what. As well as the new bearings, I electroplated, like zinc plated all the bolts and everything myself. There's a video on how to do that on my channel. That's all parts. This is all parts in here. This is the new chain roller I made. We'll get to that. So this is all parts in here as well. And then back here, all these boxes that are labeled X600, these are also parts too. So we have to work out where they all go. So the way I assembled this one, one thing I do remember is I actually deviated slightly from the way these are supposed to be put together. That's why I have all these bearing seals that are no longer in bearings. So this whole case is filled with oil when the car's running. So this the chain, rather than a motorbike where you have to like grease the oil, the chain every time you ride it or whatever, you actually fill this with oil like a gearbox and it's half full of oil and the chain's just constantly in oil. What it seems like is supposed to happen is these, the bearings I took out of it, as you can see they're unshielded. So a modern bearing, if there's one in here somewhere, uh, well not a modern bearing, but you have a shielded bearing, so this has got rubber on each side, and that's got grease packed inside it. All the bearings inside here don't have shields on them, because obviously this is full of oil, so you don't need their own grease in the bearings, the oil just goes in the bearing because it's in there. This bit here is the wheel bearing, there's a bearing in the front here, and there's a bearing in the end. And when I pulled it apart, these end bearings had no shields on them, so that tells you that this is supposed to be full of oil, which you would assume this being full of oil, the oil is also going down this hole into this bearing. However, there's actually a seal, like a rubber lip seal and stuff that goes in here to stop oil getting down there. So I'm not 100% sure how the oil really gets there and whether it gets circulated through there very well. So what I'm going to do is I've decided to run sealed bearings for the two wheel bearings and then run an open bearing where the oil is. Every modern car for the last 50 years has just used a sealed bearing with, well, 50 years, but anyway, any modern car you've got is a sealed bearing, modern bearings, modern grease. I think that's going to be a better solution than having oil come out there, because that also adds another gasket, more seals, and more places for oil to leak. So we're going to run the oil on the chain, we're going to seal the bearing inside for the wheel bearings, they're just going to be standard bearings running in normal grease. Right, so I'm pretty sure these are going to be the bearings I need. I made sure I got made in Japan ones, because we've got to keep it, got to keep it on brand. The thing I need is the sprockets that the chains run on, because that's what the bearings like go on. I know I need that. That's one chain sprocket. And then the other one is apparently MIA. That's the shaft that it goes on. The other one is probably in here. Yes, it is. With the bearing still on. And that's our chain, too. So I haven't actually, I've replaced everything, like bearings and stuff. I haven't replaced the chain, but the chain feels pretty good. And the fact that it runs in oil, I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure chains in the 60s are. Just great. 
And thankfully, in my previous laziness, when I stripped this down, not removing this bearings, gives me a bit of a head start to actually know which bearing is supposed to go back on here. So we'll get the press or the bearing puller, and we'll pull these off and go from there. I just noticed I think ahead better than I thought I do. I actually wrote, <laughs> I wrote on each one what it's for. So that's good. Start by pressing this one off because it's the easy one. Go in the press here. Just need to get my Honda Civic Turbo out of the way, which unfortunately is quite heavy, so I have to go get something to move this. Whoa! Wow, that took a lot more force than I was expecting. Just as I was knocking this bearing the rest of the way off, I just noticed there's an O-ring in there, which is nice. So now I know where one of my thin O-rings goes. I do remember that there's O-rings on either one of these gears to stop oil like ending up in the middle of the shaft here, which is once again why I want to put normal bearings in the end of that. But it's nice to find them when I'm taking it apart, so I remember, like I know now for sure, that's where one of those thin O-rings goes. While I'm here, and I know this one's a 6305, may as well go press the next 6305 back onto it. The fact that this was still on this shaft means that I know I can put it back on first because that's the opposite of the order that it came apart in. And a new o-ring for it as well. Always put a quick smear of grease on a press press fit for a bearing before you press it on. It just stops the two metals from like calling together and getting stuck while you're trying to press it on. So we'll back to the press, put this on there. We go. Same for our o-ring, tiny bit of grease. There is a special like o-ring grease that I should probably put on this, but I don't have any, so it's getting regular grease, because that's what we got. Next one to swap is this bearing, which is the like front idler thing. I uh, don't remember how I get this off, because it's not going to fit in the press. I think we'll try and fit a bearing puller on it, and I'll probably have to put something in the middle here to stop the bearing puller like just going through the hole. Okay, I don't remember what I did last time, but I've worked out a way to do it. I can't, like, the bearing puller grabs onto the bearing and pushes, but it can't push because it fits through the middle. Thankfully, the rear end of this car, every spline is the same. So these splines are the same, and the spline for the axle through the tube is the same. This gear doesn't go on here, but it does actually fit. So what I can do is put this on. I can get the nut that's supposed to hold the wheel bearing on. That fits on there. That nut is small enough for the bearing to fit around it, and there's a center point in here for a bearing puller. So I can use this to pull this bearing off. One thing I've found that's very handy as well as a vice is it's been really good to have a lathe chuck hanging around so I can hold this shaft upright and work on it. I found this chuck at the metal recyclers. I was like, can I have that? And they're like, yeah, whatever, because it's worth about 10 cents in scrap metal. But I looked it up, the logo on it, turns out this thing was made in probably the late 1890s or early 19, like 10, which is pretty cool. I didn't know it was that old. I was gonna turn it into a welding fixture, which would have kind of ruined it. So now I use it as like a, a bench chuck. What I should really do with it is make like a little mount where it actually attaches solid to the bench. But even without it being attached to the bench, it's heavy and it makes a nice like stable base for working on things like this. Oh man, I was really hoping this would just pop off. I can tell it's gonna be a pain. Come on. Oh, there it goes. Oh yes, I was like, when I pulled this thing apart in the first place, like the other side, there was some freaking like stuck bearings and seized bolts and then I had a lot of trouble with it. Thankfully this one seems to be coming off. Now this is the replacement bearing. This is another bearing. The original one had the seals taken off it. I'm putting in the sealed one. When I took this apart, one of these cases, this area was packed full of grease. So maybe that's why these are open because you're supposed to pack the whole axle tube bit full of grease. I'm not sure about that because one side, this is one complete axle off a car. One side was packed with grease, one side wasn't. So maybe one side was leaking, the oil was getting in there and like washing the grease out or something. But I definitely think that keeping sealed bearings with just modern sealed bearings and modern grease is going to be the better way to go rather than once this is trying to pack this whole freaking space with grease. Now given that this bearing and this gear are on the oil filled side of it, we need to pop these seals out. You can actually buy a bearing with no seal on it, but one I always forget to specif specify and generally they have seals. And plus two, I'd rather have a bearing with a seal and not need the seal than one without a seal and need it. Because all you do is poke a screwdriver under it and there it goes, so I always buy sealed ones. If they end up being the wrong size or saying they can get used for something else or whatever, but yeah. Two seconds to deseal them. We'll go press it onto here now. I know this one definitely doesn't have an O-ring. This ends up supported in the end here, and there's nothing else like attached to it. It's just sort of in free space, so no O-ring for this one. Now this is pressed on. The obvious thing to do here is we can press that in there. However, you'll be mistaken. It's not 
obvious because this is the obvious thing but once this is pressed all the way down this lip here actually stops the chain from getting onto it now if I'd broken the chain so it was like a strip you could thread it around it but because the chain is still attached in a loop I have to put the chain on this before I press it in because if yeah if you forget to do that this is really hard to get out again Right, I might actually heat this up a bit first, so that's not quite so hard to push in. <laughs> this was heated with about, with, I checked with the moment, it was about 75 degrees. That was going to be like a press job. When it's hot, two taps of the hammer, it falls straight in. <laughs> makes it makes a big difference. Yeah, you can see now what I mean. You can't actually get the chain back off that sprocket once it's pressed into the into the case. Now they've got this piece pressed in. Pretty sure the next thing to make do makes sense would be put this in here, and we can start stacking stuff on this end of it. Now that this is pressed in, we can put this other bearing on the outside. The next thing to go on is a lip seal, which is in a bag here somewhere, probably. Not that one. Turns out I hadn't actually bought the seals for this yet. So I went to the bearing shop, picked up some of those. This is like two weeks ago that I was doing this. I thought I ordered all the seals, I actually didn't. This seal is a special one from Germany that I have to order that's specific to the car. We'll get to that one in a minute. But these ones are just bearing shop seals. So I've got those, we'll press them in and then move on. Hopefully you can hear me over the rain because it's bucketing down pretty good. Seals are something a lot of people seem to get stuck on. I see lots of posts on Facebook people going, oh, where do I get this cam seal, or where do I get this crank seal, or axis seal, or whatever. And you can go and buy them from Honda or Nissan or Toyota or any of the big companies for like $15, $20 each. Seals are a standard thing. You can see on this one here, if the camera wants to focus on it, it says 37.55.8. And all that means is 37 mil on the outside, or sorry, 37 on the inside, 55 on the outside, 8 mil thick. You just go to a bearing shop, go, hi, can I please have a 37.55.8 lip seal? And they'll be like, I don't know, $3 each, $5 each, whatever. This car was built in the 60s. Even the seals that come off this, they've got the standard writing on them for what sizes they are. Same with bearings. So this is an original diff bear, or original axle bearing out of the car. And then written on it, the bearing is just a 6207. You just go to the bearing shop and go, hey, I need a 6207, please. And they'll be 10 bucks rather than spending. People spend so much time trying to track down like original parts or like bearings from Honda for things. They're just bearings, they're just seals. Just go to the bearing shop, they're like, hey, I need a 6205 and a 37558. You just order them. So, bearing shop, $5 later, here's my two bearings. The stupid German one we'll get to later, but I got that one too. $40 or whatever it was. 40 euros, something stupid. Anyway, insert bearings. So we've got our chain case here. This is the section we don't want the oil, we don't want the oil in. You know what this seal is doing? So, that bearing in there is obviously not a oil tight seal, stuff will still get in the inner and outer diameter of it. So the way this bearing seals, is we push it in there, this seal, sorry, it seals the outside, and then our gear goes on top of that. A lot of the time it's stuff like this, because I don't remember how this goes together, this actually has a chamfer on one side and not on the other, so I don't remember which way up it goes, but I know that it runs on this seal, and I can see the polished line where the seal has been rubbing on the gear. So even though I don't remember which way up it goes, little witness marks like that will allow me to work out which way up it goes. So we'll press this one in, I'll put a bit of grease on it, or a bit of oil, and then we can put the chain on. The other thing, just while well, I remember, the other thing is, this, because I don't remember how this came apart, I don't know which way up this goes. We're sealing oil from going from here that way. The way a lip seal works, is this side there's a lip that can push in and this side is flat so you can imagine oil pushing this way just pushes the lip up out of the way whereas pressure pushing from this side is actually closing the lip down onto things so this will go in that way so our oil is holding the lip closed so if you're ever wondering which way around a seal goes you want the oil to be closing your lip seal not pushing it open because they're only 
They'll hold pressure both ways, but they'll hold way more pressure and work much better going the way they're designed to go. So this thing, given that this is just splash lubricated, would probably work if I put it in backwards by accident, but it definitely goes this way, and that's sort of how you tell which way around it goes without actually knowing. Got my nice oil can, period correct oil can from my 1960s car. This has just got gearbox oil in it. Now this seal is a pretty loose fit. I can probably just push it in with my fingers. Just, I'll give it a quick tap as well. This seal's a bit of a weird one because I'm sort of installing it from the inside out, whereas normally seals you're putting from the outside in. So normally you've got this nice flat face to press them in by, but because I don't, these seals are actually molded with a steel, like there's a steel piece inside the outside. So as long as I'm careful to only tap the outside edge of it and keep it going in straight, it's fine to just tap it in like that. You just gotta be careful not to bash that in a lip of it, which you can't really do with a hammer, but if you're using a punch, which I'll have to do in a second, you can damage it by hitting the inside lip. Ideally, on paper, you'd have a round thing that fit on that to press it in, but not everyone has a whole set of bearing press thingies. I actually do, but they're on a shelf and I can't bother to get them. We'll just go till it's flush, and that's good. And then, same for our gear, we'll put a touch of oil, make sure it's clean, it's going to lubricate, slide on the seal nicely. That fits in there, so we'll chuck the chain on it. I did this, I did give this a bit of a clean up with a piece of scotch brod as well, just to give the seal a nice surface to run on. It wasn't like pitted, if it was pitted we'd be having some problems, I'd have to do something else. Actually, if it was pitted, what you would do, instead of buying a 37.55.8, you buy a 36.55.8, so the hole's one mil smaller, you'd machine one mil off this to get rid of the pitting, and then you're on your way again, so... Yeah, knowing that the bearings and the seals are just standard sizes and you can just go buy whatever size one you want, it's very handy. Cool. That's our S600 chain drive. If we... the next thing, there's a nut that holds this on. One thing that you could miss when I think about this is this whole section, we're thinking about keeping oil out of here. So the oil comes to here, it can't get down this edge here because the outside of the seal is blocking it. And it can't get through under the gear and down the inside of the shaft because the inside of the lip seal is blocking it. However, oil can get through these threads, down through the spline, and then into this side of the gearbox. So, there's obviously a seal that goes here, and what goes there is an o-ring. These are the only two I have left in my bag when I ordered them. Unfortunately, o-rings aren't as nice as seals where they say the size, they've just got random numbers. This is a BS118, and this is a BS021. I'm pretty sure that does decode into the size, I don't know what it is. Once again, you just go to the bearing shop, go, hey, I have this, can you give me another one, please? And they go, here you go, that's 10 cents. Don't go to Honda or Nissan and spend $10 on an o-ring because it's just a rubber circle. So one of these will be, I think it's these ones, the right size to sit in that hole. Maybe not this one. Once again, just to be on the safe side, I've got the original 1960s parts book for it. You can see on an exploded diagram, we've got the nut, we've got a washer, and then 23. It kind of doesn't look like an o-ring in the picture because it's a crappy thing from the 1960s, but if we go to part 23, o-ringu. So, cool, o-ring, just to double check. The parts manual, like the parts exploded diagram is always super handy for stuff like this. And, and, I'm not done yet, another line of defense to make sure we got the right part going in the right place. I haven't thrown out the old o-rings or seals yet. This is the old o-ring, come on camera focus. You can see it's actually got the print from where it was squashed up against the spline in there, so I'm a hundred million percent sure an o-ring goes in the end of that. Same with our o-ring. We'll give the o-ring a dab of, dab of gearbox oil. I should probably be using proper like o-ring silicon grease because in theory oil is not good for o-rings but this o-ring is going to live its whole life in this chain case full of this same gearbox oil so that's that's where it's going and it's going to like it I'm pretty sure it's in there since 1965 and it, this one wherever it went this one it's, it hasn't gone crunchy yet so calling that good digging back in my box a bit so I have this cup of random stuff that will be it's a very squashed washer, so that's the one off there. I bet you, there you go, the washer has the mark from where it has spent the last 50 years squashed against that o-ring. So I will give this a clean, and I've got the castellated nut that goes with it, according to what's in the manual and what looks like it goes on there. There's holes through this for pins, so obviously the nut that I put on it has got to be the castellated one. So 
I'll give these a clean and then chuck them on. So make sure this o-ring is pretty fat to go in here. It is definitely the right one because like I said I have the original one. But we'll make sure it's in its groove all the way first because if I just slam this on there and tighten it down it's going to like squeeze the o-ring out the sides if it's not sitting in place properly. This o-ring does actually fit down inside this gap if I squash it in there properly. With this Allen key squasher. And when I took this thing off it was super tight and it's as tight as I can get it now without holding this. What we'll assemble next is we'll leave the inside of it and I'll put the hub together on this side because when I took it apart having the, I remember having the big nut on each side when I could put two big tubes on it and undo it. When I say big tubes I literally had like two or three meter tubes on this because it was super super tight. But yeah if we chuck the other side on that will give me good purchase to do this up tight. You know, digging through my parts bin, I've got this piece that I've already cleaned up and painted. Off the top of my head, the bearing goes on, there's an o-ring that goes on there, which I think is this one. There's a gasket, there's this thing, there's a brake backing drum, then there's the hub, then there's a washer, then there's a nut, there's a split pin. So I've rounded up the parts, there's the brake drum, there's the gasket I need. I actually laser cut these on my like homemade crappy laser cutter thing. There's a video on my channel if you want to see laser cutting gaskets at home. But this is good, because every time I have to rebuild this now, I just laser cut the gaskets instead of cutting them out by hand. So what I'm obviously going to do now is just double check the order I think these go in with the parts book. But let's say we don't have a parts book again and we'll see what we can figure out. So the fact that I already have the o-ring stuck in this piece sort of gives away there's an o-ring there. But that's obviously an o-ring groove and the o-ring fits in there nicely. The next thing is going to be this gasket. So the brake backing plate goes on here a direction and it fits one way. This gasket could either go under the brake backing plate or on top of it and then this piece obviously goes on top of that. So the thing we need to think of is where do we actually have to seal stuff from getting and that will tell us where the gasket goes. The other thing we can look at to figure out where the gasket goes is even though I've sandblasted and cleaned this plate there's still traces of where the like the slight pitting is in the rust from where the gasket was. We can tell that the gasket was on this front side of this because we can see the square from where the gasket's been sitting and the steel's been kept good, it's pitted on the outside. Whereas on this side, it's obviously open to the elements because it's gotten a lot rustier around that face. So we know that the gasket goes on the inside of the brake backing plate thing. And then just to confirm, there's the manual. We go body, brake backing plate, gasket, o-ring, cover thing, and then there's a lip seal that goes in the end of that. So let's do that. It's kind of cheating with laser cut gaskets. They fit very, very well. Maybe too well. Oh, that's nice. Now we're ready for some nuts, which is kind of exciting. This is my bucket of all the external hardware. These have been zinc plated, like zinc electroplated, which is what they were supposed to look like when they were new. Obviously these were all rusty when I pulled them apart. I zinc electroplated these at home myself. There's a video on my channel if you want to have a look at how to do home zinc electroplating. So we'll pick out the nuts we need for this and bolt it up. Yeah. Once again the manual coming in handy here. Is this white nut supposed to have a washer underneath it? Which is kind of a stupid question because if you've got a car from any like reputable manufacturer, maybe some American ones use washers, but any any of the main manufacturers like Toyota or Honda or whatever don't have washers on bolts, you've probably never come across them because this is what a modern bolt for a car looks like. It's called a flange nut. So you can see it's a nut, but it's got a flared end on it and it acts like a washer by itself. And this is a, come on camera focus. This is a serrated flange nut. So it's actually got teeth as well, which help it bite into stuff. These are the original nuts from the S600 that I've plated. You can see they don't actually have flanges on the bottom. So there's a lot of spots on the car where you're supposed to use washers with them. This would have been one where I think there's supposed to be a washer. But we refer to the manual, this is the front of that gearbox with the studs, no washers, so they're going on just like this. I'm also giving them a small, small dot of anti-seize, just, just because. So when someone tries to re-restore this car in another, another like 70 years, it's a bit easier for them. Also notice that I showed you this nut as an example of the zinc plated one, because this one's kind of dull looking, so pay a professional to do your zinc plating, or don't. They, it's nice that, I know I did it myself, but they, some of them look kind of shit. <laughs> also, it just occurred to me that I should have put this seal on, which goes in there first, but I've already put the nuts on now, so I'll just put it in afterwards. It doesn't really matter, but it, it's order of operations. It's not like maths. It doesn't really matter. You can sort of make it work. 
sometimes. The other thing I'm sure you've noticed is this is pieces sticking up a little bit. When I've pressed the bearing onto the other side, it's pushed this one up a little bit. But once this is all tightened down and the two big nuts are tightened down, it'll squeeze all the bearings back to where they're supposed to be. This is all bolted down. Our next piece here is the lip seal that goes on. Once again, this is a nice machine finish. It's obviously made for a seal to sit in. We can confirm that by our hub has the little polished metal section where you can see the lip seal has been rubbing. I know some people will argue that you shouldn't oil the outside of the seal because it could cause it to spin in the bore. I find that that is incorrect because if the bore fit is so loose that the seal can spin with or without oil, then something else is wrong, the bore's wrong, the seal is wrong, something else is wrong. But mainly, I've had plenty of seals where you press them in, and because the seal, even though it's got a metal ring inside it, like the seal's still rubber on the outside, and if the, it doesn't slide in nicely, you want it to compress into the hole, and if it's all gripping and stuff, it will can tear the edge of the seal and you get leaks, and I think you're much better off a little bit of oil or a little bit of grease on the outside of your seal before you press it in. You'll have a much better time. This is also another example where someone will tell you you should have like a nice thing to fit over this and hammer it all in one go. But if you're not a Neanderthal and you're just careful, no reason why you can't work it in evenly with a punch. A nice big flat punch, but a punch. In one of my other videos when I stripped this down, these hubs were really painful to get off here. So it feels nice now they sort of just slide back on like that and that's it, back in place. Now I can go back to my bucket of nice electroplated stuff. Got my fancy springy washer cone thing that I electroplated and my nut. You notice there's not much thread there for the nut to bite onto. And that's because, like I said, when we pushed this through, it's actually pushed the whole Oops, it's pushed the whole assembly out the back here a bit. Once we start screwing them, it'll pull the whole thing together and all the bearings will go back into place and stuff. Yeah, I can feel that's pulling the whole assembly down into place. Tighten this up, we need the big spanner, made in Germany. My nice period correct dad out spanner that I got from my non when he passed away. It's cool having some old tools that match the age of the stuff that you're working on. I have another one of these, I have two. And then the other one's a Barco one this size. Oh, is the Barco one or is this one? One of them actually says made in West Germany on it because <laughs> it existed before the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is kind of cool. And, and things made in West Germany speaking of, the spare tire in one of my cars still says, still says made in West Germany on the tire. So I should probably put a new spare in it, but I just really like the fact that the tire says made in West Germany, so it's I'm keeping the old one because it's funny. And one day I'll be stuck on the side of the road and be like, shit. Should have bought a new tire instead of relying on this West German one. I can feel this like screwing together and pulling the bearings in. And then once it tightens up, I'll double check the manual and we'll talk it to spec. Although, I think, I'm trying to remember what I did for the other side. I think this was so high a torque, I decided to not torque it to spec yet and just torque it down once this was actually mounted to the car. Because then I can use the brakes to hold the car in place which is what you normally do for axle nuts, because I think it was too much to actually be able to hold it down on the bench and tighten it. There. Okay, that is as tight as I can get it without it falling off the bench. And it runs, runs smooth. While we're over this end, we'll address this. This is the breather. So this is full of oil, put the other side on, it's got a seal around it, the sump plug, like the fill plug sealed, the drain plug sealed, everything's sealed. You can't have a sealed thing with oil in it because it heats up, the oil expands and it's going to blow a seal out. So you have to have breathers. Your engine has breathers, your gearbox has breathers, your diff has breathers. Everything with... Something's moving over there. It's just a bag. Everything has oil and has breathers. So what this is is a breather. There's a little gallery through there and then a thing through here and a little hole. and It stopped the oil sloshing up but let air get in and out. This piece is kind of rusty and a bit crap looking still. To get this piece out, it's steel. What you'd have to do is heat the case and then pull it out, re-zinc electroplate it and then press it back in. The risk reward of that, having a nice zinc electroplated one versus breaking it on the way out wasn't worth it. But it does have a little cap that goes on it. And I did, where are they? I did electroplate little caps. So the other thing is that little piece is also covered by a cap. But it fell apart when I took it out because it was 60 years old. There's a little foam breather that's supposed to go in there. So what I did for that was get a spare air filter and we get a wad punch, which is like a very robust hole punch. Piece of aluminium, put our punch on there, give it a whack. 
And there's our little filter piece. We didn't quite cut all the way through because this wad punch is a bit shit. There's our filter. Fits in our hole. And you can say how many people do you know running uni filter chain case breathers. Nice. Factory fresh. No, you can't see it. Nice. And the next thing to deal with is this. On a motorbike or something, what you would do is move the back wheel to chain, tighten or loosen the chain. I can't tighten or loosen the chain here, so what goes on here is a chain tensioner. You would have seen in one of the other videos, the chain tensioners are rubber and had fallen to bits. So, the solution for that is you go to the guy in Germany and you buy a new rubber roller, but instead of doing that, I go to the machine shop place in Canberra, buy this piece of UHMW, which is ultra high molecular weight plastic, I machine it down into a new roller, and then I fit it to the original chain tensioner. So instead of spending 40 bucks on a new roller, I spent 100 bucks on a piece of plastic, and like six hours of my life making them from scratch. And if you don't understand why you would do that, then you shouldn't be restoring old cuts. But basically, this piece goes this way, fits in there, and then we get to it on the outside. This is adjustable from outside, and that sets the tension. There's also another one that I just had in my hand, and now it's gone. Oh yeah. This one here, which goes at the top, which just sort of stops it from, from slapping around. I do have a video making these. I don't think I've uploaded it, and I, if I can find the footage, I'll put it here. And if I can't find the footage, then too bad. It's just lathe work on the old Soviet lathe, turning this piece of plastic into that piece of plastic. The only other mod that was needed for this was that these are actually welded pins. So you can kind of see where this has been angle ground. I had to grind the pins off, make new pins, or I forget if I used the old ones. Drilled and tapped them, put a thread on it, loctited that in. So this has still got the original roller bearing in it, but it means now this is removable and serviceable. You can see the mark here from where the old chain had actually worn the roller down so far that it was rubbing on the steel piece. Uh, also, I will put a small dot of oil on this where it runs in that. So actually, maybe a piece of grease. This one's more of a grease job. So we'll do that put this together. There's a song... There's a song stuck in my head while I'm doing this, and I can't remember... I know the song, it's a very good, like, idle doing background song, and I can't remember what it is. But if I remember what it is, I'll say it. This thing doesn't run on a bearing, it's just in the aluminium casing, which would wear it out really fast if it was spinning all the time. But like I said, it's only really there to stop the chain, like, smacking around, so it shouldn't really be spinning that often. Which I guess is why it's got no actual bearing or anything on it. This is also original, it doesn't have any signs of wear on it, so it can just go back in, because it's, it's not working very hard. That is this half of it done. So I can actually put this on the ground now. I'll do a quick rearrange of the bench, and we're going to start working on the diff end, ready to put this side on. Okay, this is getting quite big and unwieldy and hard to film. This is backwards. This should face like this. I can kind of fit that way. I, this, it's no longer backwards. It's now upside down. This is the bottom of the diff. But basically, this block here, bolts go through this and bolt it to the car, and then the diff is supported on the snout here. So this whole section is solid, and this piece pivots up and down. So, the place that this pivots up and down uh, is on this. This is the other half of the chain case. This slides over there. This is a bearing up and down in here. So it's rubbing on this part. And as you can see, the weight of the car is actually supported on this. So this is the other bush block thing that goes in there. This has this spiral cut into it inside. So when you pump grease into it, the grease sort of moves along the whole thing. It's been sitting for 20, or well, more than 20 years. It's been sitting for 40 years probably. You can see it's rusted that spiral into it, so I know that goes on there, but you just know by looking at it. This is where the seal thing kind of comes apart a little bit. On the end of this are these seals. These unfortunately are not standard size seals, as you can see, it's a really weird shape. It does actually have 60.5105113.18. It's got a size on it like it's a seal, but this is like a Honda specific thing, same for this big giant one. The best I can do for old seals like this is you get engine stop leak, because what stop leak does, you put in your engine and it's meant to soak into the rubber and replace some of the chemicals that get lost out of rubber and swell them up and soften them. So these were very hard and crusty and I soaked them in that for like a few weeks, like ages ago, and now they feel like a new rubber seal. So it's never going to be as good as a new one, but that's the best you can sort of do for an old car like this. So we'll start by fitting those pieces onto here. This is the first one to go on that goes onto this end. It's kind of hard to see in there. This is a separate ring, and I've greased it because this is actually a thrust bearing. So when you're cornering this car, obviously the force is this way, and these pieces are trying to slide up and down this tube. So this one goes on first, and this tube is actually butted up against the inside of that, and that's what's transmitting our cornering force. 
Well, so for those of you seeing me using a Swiss tool soft dead blow hammer and wondering maybe they are worth the money, do not buy it. I got given this as like part of my apprenticeship and these are like 200 bucks or something stupid. The crappy like plastic, like orange lead filled ones you get at like any random tool shop for like $15 or better. I don't, this hammer's not very good. Do not recommend. So do as I say, not as I do as far as hammers go. If I have any leaks with this thing once it's together, I reckon it's going to be from one of these lengths of seals. Because there's a whole bunch of these seals that all sort of stack on top of each other in various layers. And as far as I know, nobody makes copies of these. And they seem quite crusty. In theory, if all the O-rings and stuff inside the end of this tube, and the O-rings inside our chain cases don't leak ever, oil shouldn't really be getting into this bit. Kind of, but it kind of also does because it comes from the diff and goes through these holes. But it's in like, there's a lot of layers here. I reckon if I have a problem with leaks, this is where that problem will be coming from. So that goes on. This is a good case of check the manual for which way around it goes, but I can just look at that one so I know which way around it goes. You've seen me using my finger for the grease for little tiny bits. This one's a bit much to be using my finger, so this will be getting pumped with grease with a grease gun, but for now we'll spread it on the inside with a ruler. I've decided to sacrifice this ruler for grease because we can just wipe it afterwards. I wonder how many people skip my videos because I just talk about too much crap. The grease ruler. Oh yeah, nice. And then this piece goes on top of that piece. This one needs some grease in it as well. This one can get the finger because it doesn't need a big slathering of it. Most of the small bits like this that I've painted, I've been using this uh, epoxy rust guard stuff. I've been very happy with it, like I'm just hitting that with a hammer and you can't actually see what I've been hitting it, which is nice. The only downside is you can't touch it for 16 hours after you spray it. Like any other spray paint, even though it says that, you know you can sort of pick it up after a couple of hours. This stuff, absolutely not. It has to hang up for like ages, which kind of sucks if you're trying to do things quickly. But I've found for stuff that you want to be nice, it's a nice like satin finish and it seems to last very well considering, yeah, I've been hitting it with a hammer and I've used it on heaps of other stuff on my cars and it's been good. You can see inside here, maybe, it's bronze with little dots in it. So the idea, this is grease on the outside of this grease nipple. This bit in here, oil is coming out of the diff through these little holes. Remember this diff is upside down, so oil should come out these holes and fill this inside section. This bronze with little dimples in it, the little dimples act to hold the oil in there and sort of distribute it as needed. So I probably won't fill it with grease to help it along to start with because I don't want those little holes to be getting too packed up. I'll probably just oil it and then we'll slide it on. Keeps your, keeps your skin healthy. It's good. I kind of like this table surface. This table's masonite, and I did look it up. It's non-asbestos masonite, but I did find this table in like an alleyway near my work and then just made it disappear. I was worried it was chucked out because it was asbestos, but it does a really good job of absorbing oil. I've spilt so much, like, you can see the outline of where I've spilt tons of oil, but it sort of just disappears. It kind of sucks in that when you drag stuff around on it, like the corners of this, it picks it up and scrapes it, but it's really good at just making drips of oil disappear. I'm also kind of putting money on it in like 20 years, people will be like, oh, masonite also causes like lung cancer disease. I'll be like, oh. There you go. Uh, the other thing with doing this is this thing, when it's the two chain cases in the diff, I could move it around really easily. And now that this thing has been a solid chain case, ow, my arm's stuck. Now that this, now that this thing has been a solid chain case and a diff for the last like few months it's become very inconvenient to move and it's just getting on the side of being too heavy for me to lift and now that it's going to have the other chain case attached to it I definitely won't be able to lift it so I'm going to have to like find a more permanent home for this thing rather than just moving it out of the way all the time anyone that's been here in the last two years probably remembers climbing over this thing to get to the bathroom because that's, that's where it's been sitting for the last however long but that's on there seems like it moves smoothly I'm just getting ready to chuck the bolts in here. I was just giving them a quick clean. I didn't electroplate them because they go inside the freaking diff thing. I have never seen these in real life before. I've read about them and I've seen like technical drawings of them. I've never seen one in real life and I did not expect to find one in something this old. I thought there was like a modern thing. You've all heard of these before. It's a nylock nut. It's a nut with a piece of nylon in it. 
the piece of nylon like plastic it's kind of like squishy ish plastic it's smaller than the thread so when you screw it down the nylon is like squishing down onto the thread to stop the nut from rattling loose this is a nylon bolt I've yeah like I said I've seen them it's really cool I've never actually seen one I was just cleaning it and see it's actually got oh, when the camera focuses see it's got a little nylon plug sticking out of the side of it so that, when it was new, I think, wouldn't have had the thread squashed into it, but you can reuse them, as long as they still feel alright, which this one does. You can see it's got a little nylon, like, cylinder, so like a hole drilled through it and nylon pressed into it. So when I screw that in, that little nylon bit actually grips the inside of the threaded hole, and it acts as a vibration-proof bolt. But yeah, I've only ever read about nylon bolts, and there it is. I didn't expect it to be a thing from the 60s. Now, this thing is getting hard to video because it's kind of big, but I'll try and explain this to you. This caused me a lot of trouble when I took this apart. This lens isn't quite right for this, but it's the best autofocus one I have, so we'll stick with it. This chain case thing here, if I pull it, it will just still slide off. <laughs> the way this is held on here is kind of complicated, so this bucket of stuff here is what those parts are. I was looking at the manual and I couldn't really figure it out. Luckily, I had... Another, I've got two more of these axles, and I had one that was together that wasn't as rusty as this one, and I could figure out how it was held on. But I can see there's a groove there, and I thought there'd be like a circlip of some description, but there isn't. It's these pieces, so I'll give them a quick wipe, and we'll have a look. Now, the way this setup works is there's these two pieces that have like a flange around the inside and a little hole in them. So these actually go down over there, and that little inside flange locks into a groove there, so it acts like a C-clip, but... We've got that thrust bearing in there taking all the cornering load this way, but cornering load pulling the wheel off this way is all taken by this thing. Obviously, if the wheel is pulling this way, it's the inside wheel, so it's unloaded, so there's much less force pulling the whole assembly towards this than it is pushing against that, that way, so that's why this side doesn't need a specific bearing. What happens is these go on there, then this ring actually fits over the top of it to lock them together, so there's no way for them to, like, split and come off the thing. And then once these are in there, they're a bit rusty, I better give them a bit more of a clean up. <laughs> it's kind of nice seeing how rusty this stuff is, because the inside of this whole thing was this rusty, so it's cool seeing how far it's come. But if I can eventually get these to fit in here... Okay, I've put them in there now, I can't get them out. Once this ring is over the top, these can't separate anymore. And then this snap ring goes over there to stop this ring from coming out. So when this is all caked in grease and rust, it was so hard to figure out how this was supposed to go together. Because these parts are drawn in the exploded diagram, but they're not drawn very clearly. It's very hard to work this out, but now that I know how it goes together, it's a pretty cool little way of retaining this without any screws or bolts that can come loose, and it's a really strong way of retaining it versus using a normal C-clip. These ones are pretty high load and low movement. Probably wouldn't be a bad idea to grease them instead of oiling them, but they do get oiled the whole time they're actually in the car, so we'll go with some oil. Next thing we put in is the axle. This is a lot easier than normal <laughs> rear-wheel drive car to put the axle in because this end doesn't have the wheel attached, it's just got that gear. So it doesn't have any circlips or anything that like need to be removed or put in and out. The axle literally just goes in, spline, and that's it. Axle fitted. But you'll notice there's a groove here. This groove is for an O-ring. So on this, we have the oil in the chain case, we have the oil in the diff, which is over there. One thing that always kind of confusing with this is it has separate oil for the chain cases and the diff. So what I would have expected you would do is you would just fill the diff to halfway like you normally do, and the oil would just spill through these tubes and fill the chain cases and everything would just stay half full. Honda instead decided to seal the diff and the chain cases separately, so there's a seal behind here to stop oil getting into the diff. And then this o-ring that goes on here, I'll explain in a second, but it seals inside the gear on the chain case, and there's another seal that goes on here that seals the outside of the gear on the chain case. The only reason I could think of them for running separate oil chambers in the cases and the diff is it's the same type of oil. In theory, if you were turning a corner for a really long time, like you drove around a roundabout in the same direction for like 10 minutes, all the oil would slowly work its way to the other side, and the chain case on this side would end up with no oil in it. For that to happen in the real world would probably not happen unless you're using the car for like freaking sprint car racing. But Honda over-engineered the crap out of this. There's so much cool stuff in it. And I think that's why they've decided to isolate the oil from each side. So even if you do decide that you just want to drive in a circle for an extended period of time, it's not going to have diff oil problems. Because I know even cars that don't have chain cases, just normal solid axle cars, they even have problems with all the oil going to one side. So I think Honda has attempted to mitigate that. And while I'm here, I can put my new O-ring on. 
Now the next thing I have to put on is this. This is the weird seal I had to buy from a like S600 specialist in Germany. For my job every day, I'm a fitter machinist as a trade, but I work as a maintenance fitter, so I work in a factory it's full of machines, gears and chains and sprockets and seals and stuff. Day in, day out, I'm pulling out seals, finding replacement ones and putting them back in. Every seal you pull out, check the number, go to the bearing shop, go, hey, hey, I need a 6208, and they go, here you go, and then I put it in. I've never seen this before. This seal, rather than being pressed into a hole, when I put it on here, it actually goes on the outside. I've never seen a seal like that before. Seals are not supposed to be put on like that. So looking at the inside of this, it's a standard uh, 30, 45, 6, I think it says, it's a standard size. So I went to the bearing shop and went, hey, I'll have a 3045, sorry, 3045 7. I think they couldn't have, yeah, this is a 6. This is a 7, so it's 7 mil thick. I knew where it would fit, the 7 wouldn't be a problem, so I got the 7 mil one. But anyway, it's because what they had. This is the 3045 7. When you put it on here, it's a loose fit because that 30, the 30 is the inside, so 30 is correct. But the 45 measurement is the outside, and this is 45 outside, and this is 45. So these are both the same seal, both for the same use, but because it sticks on the outside of the tube here, which is just really weird, I've never seen another seal do that. If you buy a standard 4535, it doesn't actually fit on there. I've never heard of a seal like this before. The people at the bearing shop have never heard of it before. I've never seen it before. This is the only car, the only thing I've ever seen that holds a seal on the outside like that. So thankfully, it's obviously a problem people have come across as a guy that makes these especially, but <laughs> This is the only time I've ever not been able to just buy a standard seal and have it fit. It's a really weird design. It's really weird that they still label it as a standard seal, but it doesn't fit like a normal seal. So 99.99999% of the time, bearing shop will have your back for seals. Never seen anything like this before, but thankfully I was able to get a replacement one. And even if I couldn't, the old ones I pulled out, you know, they were old, but they, they would have been usable still. But yeah, crazy design, but I got one thankfully. This is where this is all starting to get a bit big for my bench, I'm running out of space. But, this is our sealed oil in here. Obviously we need a seal that goes around the outside of this, which is a gasket. Our oil could slide down the splines in here to escape from this, so we've got our o-ring in here to stop that. The oil could move down the outside of this sprocket to get in there, so this seal here prevents that. The only other thing here that can leak is all these bolts around the outside are covered by the gasket, but there's one bolt that goes in the center. So there's actually a little aluminium washer that goes in here to seal it. That's a common thing that I, I noticed when I took it apart, which is lucky. But I know a lot of people miss them, and a lot of people always say on the forum and stuff, make sure you don't lose a little aluminium washer. So it pays for something like this, you don't know how it goes together. Try and think over in your head anywhere that oil could be going that's not supposed to go, and then how to combat that. The other one actually is the end of this shaft here sticks through there. So there's a little o-ring that actually goes in the end of this as well, which I have here to stop oil coming out through there. So anywhere the oil could be escaping from, there should be a system in place to stop it from escaping from that place. So once I'm happy with all that, I'm ready to bolt these two together. The only thing I need is the gasket, which I do not have a laser cut file for. I have the original one. It's really big and really odd shaped, so give me a minute. I'm going to trace this onto a piece of paper and cut it out with scissors. And by paper, I mean like actual gasket paper, not, not printer paper. Unfortunately, don't really have any life-changing tips for you here. It's just pen, scissors, arts and crafts. Luckily, the rolls of paper that I get from Supership Auto are just big enough. Just. I should really just make a laser cutting, like a laser cut file for this gasket, save me ever having to do this again. But it's a bit of a weird shape. The gasket that I cut out for the end of the chain case, I just measured it with a pair of verniers and drew it on the computer. What I would do for this one is just take a photo of it and then like scale it in the computer and trace over the photo. But what I would like to do is 3D scan the chain case and then design a gasket from that. I do have a 3D scanning video on my channel already with a little 3D scanner that I bought. It's not really supposed to be a 3D scanner, it's something I sort of bodgy to work as a 3D scanner. But it's not that great for small stuff like this, it has to be accurate. But I have recently gotten access to a much better 3D scanner, so that might be a future video. Might borrow the good scanner and we'll 3D scan this and design a laser file for it so I can mass produce gaskets and not have to cut them out with scissors like a pleb. If you're making gaskets like this, a pair of scissors obviously, but for all the little holes, the little punch that I use to cut the holes out of this filter, those little wad punches are perfect for cutting nice even holes in gaskets as well, so definitely Get yourself a set of wad punches if you're doing old cars and making gaskets and stuff. Now, I like cutting gaskets out with tin snips rather than scissors. 
and I'll explain why. Uh, first thing, don't buy cheap tin snips. Some tools you can get away with cheap. A cheap hammer works pretty much the same as an expensive hammer. Cheap tin snips are shit. Good pair of tin snips should cut paper, fabric, like all that stuff just fine. Cheap ones will like fold stuff and it's just a pain in the ass to use. When you're buying tin snips, you don't pick red or green based on which one your favourite colour is. Same with yellow. A set of tin snips is a yellow one, a green one and a red one. So hopefully the light behind me is not too bad. The yellow ones cut straight lines, the green ones cut right hand circles and the red ones cut left hand circles. You might have noticed they're labelled as left and right on the packets. It's not left and right handed, that's the direction they cut. In paper, a normal pair of scissors is like the yellow ones. You can sort of just force them to turn. In steel or aluminium, whatever, you can't just force it to go around a corner. Like, you kind of can, but it warps the whole thing. But when you're cutting things like gaskets and thick cardboard, these are really good because they cut the tight corners without having to, like, fold the piece out of the way. So a set of tin snips that are good quality, I find they're way better... Oops, kick the camera. I find they're way better for cutting gaskets than a pair of scissors are because they don't chew the gasket up. And you've got... You've got the right ones for doing your nice sharp corners with smooth radiuses. The other thing I meant to add to this is paper or steel or whatever, the curved ones will cut straight. What they will do though is you have to bend one side out of the way, whether you cut this side out of the way or this side out of the way. With these ones, this will push the right hand side out of the way and this will push the left hand side out of the way. So depending on which side of the line you're cutting on, you can keep the good material on the good side. I know myself, when I'm cutting stuff like this with scissors, I find that the blade that overlaps on the scissors is always the one that I'm trying to look at the line past, like the scissors are always in the way. Whereas with these, when I'm cutting on the outside, I can use the red ones, and the blade is on the outside of the line where I can see it. And if I was cutting this direction, I can use the green ones, and the blade is still on the outside of the line. So I can always see the line where I'm cutting, and it's always pushing the waste material away and keeping the material that I want flat. So the Left and right ones make a big difference. And I just forced the red ones to make a right hand cut for a second there, which is alright. But then the little curve where they go left, it just it just glides through it. So much better than a pair of regular scissors. Everyone should buy left and right sided tin snips. This isn't just a conspiracy from big tin snip to sell you more tin snips. It makes, makes a big difference for which way you want the cut to go. Okay, so I've finished cutting out my gasket. I just dropped it on and dropped all the bolts through it to make sure it lines up and it all lines up, which is good. So we're ready to bolt this to that side of the chain case. Just remember, before I put this gasket on, I also have to put this o-ring that seals this end on. There's a few schools of thought as to um, how gaskets should be prepared. That o-ring fits, o-ring fits in there. Um, some people say gasket surfaces should be clean, dry, put the gasket on. I've seen some people say that you should put grease on both sides of the gasket to put it on. And then the other thing you can do is this stuff, which is like gasket coating to put on. My favourite one, or the one I've sort of been trying out to see how good it is, I've seen a lot of people say, is gasket sealant on one side and grease on the other. And the thought behind that is that when you pull it apart again, the grease side should separate and the gasket should say stuck to the other side. And it means if, depending on how old the gasket is, you can reuse the same gasket a few times. And for this big complicated one that uses like a big piece of paper, I will do that. I did it on the other side as well. When we have to pull this apart, when I inevitably realise I've missed something, we have to do something with this again in a few years or a few months or a few days or whatever. We'll see if that technique actually works. So we're going to gasket goo one side and grease the other. Now, the other thing I decided to do is, because this is the end with the o-ring that seals, I think it's easier to put the shaft in this side first and then feed it through rather than have it in this end and feed it the other way. Normally I would grease the hard to remove side because then the bit that ends up with the gasket stuck to it is the easy side to clean. So what I would normally do I guess is put the gasket goo on this side because this piece I can take away and clean it. But the way this thing comes apart is all this stuff stays attached to this side and this side is actually the harder bit to get to because it stays attached to the car. So I think I'll gasket goo this side and then we'll grease this side. This is definitely the limit of what I'm comfortable working on with this bench. <laughs> Everything's got to go on top of everything else. Oh wow, this thing's like, it's all oily inside because it's been sitting for ages. Now, when you're applying the gasket goo, obviously I need to go around the inside of the bolt holes because that's where the seal is. None of this bit here has oil in it, but I'm still going to apply some of the goo out in this part. Just, like I said, to try and make sure when I pull this apart again, the gasket stays attached to that face of it. This stuff is also really gross. And pretty much never washes off your hands, so you just have gooey 
sticky fingers forever after you do this. And just to help hold it in place while I'm putting it together, we can't forget our aluminium washer that goes on this middle bolt hole to seal the hole in the middle here. I'm pretty confident that will stay there while I put it together. Using molly grease for this is probably overkill, but it's the only grease I have. This molly grease is the really, the really black stuff. It's called molly grease. This is 3% because it's got molybdenum disulfide in it. Molybdenum disulfide is like a, a mineral and the molecule, well not the molecule, like the, the mineral itself is like little discs rather than little grains or little, like I don't know, whatever the shape other stuff is, little cylinders or little spikes or whatever. They're little discs. So even when the grease part of the grease is gone, the molybdenum part still sort of slides together really nicely. And because they're lots of little discs, like if you imagined a grease that had small balls in it instead, if you imagine a bucket full of like ping pong balls or golf balls or something, you could shove your hand through it and they'd all sort of push out of the way. But if you imagine like a bucket full of coins, you can't push your hand down through the coins because they all sort of sit on top of each other. But if you slide around on the top, the coins will all sort of slide around and move together with each other. So this molly grease is really good for high pressure stuff where it's um yeah you're gonna have a lot of pressure on it and it needs to not be squeezed out and it's also good for stuff that's going to be like sitting for a long time and being used for long intervals because even when all the grease part of it's sort of broken down and washed away you still have those molybdenum particles in there helping everything move and slide and not destroy themselves so that's all greased up I do have one dowel pin here, one dowel pin on the other end, so make sure those aren't missing. I'm sure you notice when you pull stuff like this apart, there's always a couple of these little dowels that stick out tubes. They're a much tighter fit in the holes than the bolts are, so what they do is do the precision alignment for everything, and the bolts just hold it together, because the bolts... Uh, where's the bolt? Like, the bolts, when they're in the holes, they're not actually a, a tight fit. That's why you'll see gearboxes and stuff always have the dowels. So you always need at least two dowels to align something, because obviously... As you can imagine, if there's only one, it can still pivot. So that's always something to watch out for. Make sure your dowels don't end up falling out or get stuck somewhere. Make sure my aluminium washer is still where it's supposed to be. I think I'm just trying to get that spline to all match up inside there. There we go. Chuck some bolts in it. This thing is almost done. I'm keen for this to be not on my bench anymore. Uh, do these have washers? These do have washers. Like I said, I electroplated all these myself, but for washers, I wasn't going to electroplate 20 million original washers. Well, I could just go buy a bag of zinc washers instead. I'm just going around and tightening these all up now. Like, you know, if you have a five stud car or four stud, whatever, you tighten in a star pattern going opposite sides. Big flanges like this are the same. Obviously, it's a bit of a weird shape, so I can't do an exact size, but I'll sort of tighten this one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and do, like, diagonals to get the clamping pressure sort of pretty even all the way around. And I'll do it up in a few stages, especially a big flat and thin casting like this. But it feels like it's doing up nicely. Now that this is all tightened down, this is the bolt that goes to that aluminium washer. I put it in here just to stop that washer from falling down. What we can do now is we can put the chain tensioner on. So this is our, like, that white gear that I, or the white wheel that I made inside. This piece is what actually sets the tension. So there's a service interval for this, like, changing your oil, but you readjust your chain tension. This actually has a solid spline on it, so it only lets it fit on in one position. I just have to work out which position that is. So on this piece actually moves that tensioner inside, and we can adjust and slack, adjust the slack on the chain. And then this bolt, combined with this piece, clamp it all into place. So we'll roughly set the tension now, but that stuff will all reset it once it's all put on the car. So, I would say that's finished. It's good to actually have once again, another part put together on this car. Most of the stuff for an old car like this, at least at the start of the project, just seems like endless remove stuck bolt, clean stuck bolt, clean stuck part put in a pile. Whereas now I'm actually putting some things back together, which is nice. So this seems good, it feels smooth, seems like it all works. 
Um, thank you for watching the video. The next thing I'm going to go into is probably the brakes. So, see you on the next one. Plenty to get some more stuff done on this car, so hopefully there'll be a few more 600 videos rather than being months apart. But, cool, thank you very much. See you on the next video.